Coming up on DTNS, if you throw a battery in the trash, it might burn down a waste facility. A user tricks Twitter into verifying them as a candidate for Congress. And esports continues in the face of the coronavirus. But the cheering crowd, maybe not so much. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, February 28th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Jen Cutter from Toronto. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Len Peralta. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Spanning the North American continent today. Yeah. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, we were just talking about, we were just reminiscing about Street Fighter on uh, Good Day Internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so if you would like to hear that and, and more, much more, get the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Vivo's latest Apex concept phone features a 48 megapixel gimbal camera below the zoom camera. Vivo says it achieves optical stabilization in the front, back, and left, right incline directions with enhanced performance. This design was inspired by a chameleon's eyeball. Oh. Security researchers from Threat Fabric discovered a version of a banking trojan called Kerberos that can capture 2FA codes from Google Authenticator on Android. Uh, which is really bad because the whole point of second factor is to secure you. The Trojan abuses the accessibility privileges to read the screen when the authenticator app is running. Threat Fabric believes this version of the Trojan is just in the test phase. They haven't found it in the wild. So that gives Android a chance to prevent this. The U.S. Department of Justice, the DOJ, says that Best Buy, Macy's, as well as a sovereign wealth fund in the United Arab Emirates, or actually the, the DOJ itself, are all clients of Clearview AI, according to documents reviewed by BuzzFeed News. Now, Clearview software matches photos of people of interest to scraped public online photos. We've talked about them at length on the show. The documents point to Clearview being used by more than 2,200 law enforcement departments, government agencies, and companies across 27 countries. The long march towards changing what Cortana is for continues. Microsoft announced that Cortana skills, including music, connected home, and other third-party skills will no longer be available in the upcoming updated Cortana experience on Windows 10. Instead, Cortana is continuing to focus on productivity. Some of Microsoft's top skill integrations included Xbox, Fitbit, Philips Hue, Spotify, and Samsung's SmartThings all going away in the next update. Mm. But Cortana's getting down to business, so there'll be other things. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry about Cortana. She'll be fine. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit more about this uh, thing from the information about what's going on with Apple, Jen. All right. The information reports that Apple is planning to release a new iPad keyboard with a built-in trackpad later this year. It will likely be released with the next version of the iPad Pro, according to a source. The iPad OS already has mouse support through assistive touch, but it doesn't behave quite like a desktop mouse pointer a trackpad could point to more mouse integration on the iPad. Yeah, and people got real excited about this because, yeah, if you, you you can go into assistive touch and plug in a mouse and it gives you a circle. Uh, mm -hmm. But the idea that, like, ooh, maybe we'll get, like, direct mouse support with a pointer and everything. Um, I don't know. It got me excited for a half second that maybe I could use the iPad for a few more things. But I still need the not so much the power, but just, like, the multitasking capability of a full operating system. iPad OS is not quite there. What about the rest of y'all? Uh, yeah, when I when I first uh, read about this, I, I sent it to a friend and they were like, oh, so it's a laptop. And I was like, well, no, it's a hybrid. I mean, that's sort of the, the whole point of this. However, and I, I love the iPad. I, I have a few, but I've kind of fallen off because when it comes to productivity, the laptop is really or, or a desktop computer where I am now is really just what I need to be able to do a lot of things at once. And often that's the case. So something that behaves just a little bit more like a laptop because the iPad Pro in particular gets rave reviews from you know a lot of our peers. People love that. Uh, if you like that ecosystem, just for it to behave as an iPad, but also a little bit more like a laptop, that could sway me. It's not something I need, but it's something I feel like I do want. All Jen, right. what about I'm, you? I'm kind of an outlier here. I like the IBM Lenovo I only know the colloquial word for it, if you know what I'm talking about. It's not the trackpad. It's the other button in the middle of the keyboard that you can the kind nub. of maneuver like a mouse. I think the nub yes, is the another nub. way Thank of referring you. to it. That yeah. is a much better way of referring to it. Uh, but if I got a trackpad on the iPad, 
I wouldn't be sad about that to get to use, to get to use one the keyboard with it and two iPads hate my fingers because they think they're too cold so I often have to bust out like a pen with the uh, with the special uh, tablet thing that lets me use it and uh, I have been too cheap to buy a really expensive pencil but if I could buy a keyboard with a trackpad I think that would make my life a lot simpler and make my iPod more useful to me. I, one of my favorite iPad attachments is this Logitech uh, case that I got for the iPad Pro years ago because it has the old style keyboard that used to come on the Mac uh, back then. And I love it because it feels like a laptop. So adding a trackpad in there, I, I, I wouldn't be against. I'm not sure it would you know, make me be able to get by without a laptop, but I agree with you, Jen. It would but be, it kinda, be helpful. It, it also opens up the idea of just more gesture-based um uh, navigation on iPad OS that more, it, I mean, you could already do tons with just touching the screen. It'd just be a different but way. With that, it. But what I mean is you can still do that. Sure. But now you have more options without touching the screen, which I find advantageous. Yeah. Okay. The Verge's Jillian Mock uh, writes on the increasing frequency of fires in recycling plants because of discarded lithium ion batteries. I mean, it's not good to throw away any battery, but a lithium ion battery particularly is a fire hazard. If a lithium ion battery is damaged, it creates something called a thermal runaway event, or it can and often does, uh, that burns very hot and catches fire very quickly. The number of fires at waste facilities in just the U.S. and Canada rose 26% between 2016 and 2019, from 272 fires to 343 fires. And a fire like that can burn a facility down. Bill Keegan, president of Demcon Companies in Minnesota, told The Verge he thought that they lost about a facility a month to battery fires. Uh, batteries are harder to spot than other fire risks because they can be small. Uh, we're not just talking about big laptop batteries here or even phone batteries. We're talking about greeting cards with a little thing that plays in it or mm -hmm. e-cig pens, uh, stuff like that. So those little things are the ones that can cause just as much of a fire risk as the bigger ones. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that not everybody follows these rules, but I know you're not supposed to throw away a battery. But I wonder how many people think, oh, yeah, batteries, they're recyclable now. <laughs> Put them in the recycle bin. Right. You know, and now we're, we're now I'm we're you know we're being sustainable, and that's not the answer either. Yeah, they are recyclable, but at the proper battery recycling facility, not mm -hmm. in generally. I don't know. Maybe there's an exception, but I haven't heard of one. Uh, you don't throw it in the bin. Yeah, a facility a month. I had never heard about this as a problem, and I'm kind of glad that we're talking about it so other people know, because let's face it, this audience has a lot of batteries hanging around. Yeah. I have a big old okay. box of batteries, and whenever I go to Ikea, because sometimes I like the food, uh, they have a recycling spot there for batteries. So I bring that there and the light bulbs just to make sure I'm doing it right and yeah, thankfully yeah. not burning down facilities. Yeah, I mean, maybe there could be better outreach to educate people where they can go, because I, I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, Best Buy, Ikea, there's places like that where you can go and just, you know, for no charge, you just dump off your your stuff to be properly recycled. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's something to take advantage of or, or to keep in mind. I don't think they burn a facility to the ground every month. I think they, they maybe lose capacity. It feels like that would be an exaggeration to say they're losing an entire facility to fire, like, from the ground now, but even if they're just losing, you know, Bill Keegan capability. is like, no, Tom, trust me. <laughs> One burns every month. Right. Yeah. In any case, yes. Fires. Let's not do that. Let's not have battery fires at facilities. Recycle your batteries responsibly. responsibly. Okay. ZDNet's Larry Dignan uh, writes about lessons businesses are learning in remote worker management as the COVID-19 outbreak causes more workers to stay home. ZDNet points out that the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence Conference in New York, including talks from Chinese scientists over video conference. So will this reduce flights for meetings as people realize what can be done remotely that they've been spending money on otherwise? Could it affect real estate as companies get better handles on what roles need to be in the office versus what don't? It may also affect consumer behavior as more people conduct business and make purchases online. Yeah, we actually saw that effect, that last one about consumer behavior during the SARS epidemic, which was a much smaller uh, outbreak uh, where more people started to to buy things online and, and learned how to do that and, and created businesses out of that. Uh, so the, the question is, as these companies are forced to do more remote stuff, what will they realize like, oh, we always thought that would be a problem, but it's not and keep doing. And what, and on, on the flip side, like what will they realize? Gosh, you know what? This really doesn't work remote. We, we were forced into trying it and it doesn't work. I think there'll be a little of both. I also wonder 
what companies and, you know, benefiting from something like this is, is not really the direction I want to go in, but what companies will see an uptick in usage mm -hmm. based on other companies right. saying, okay, well, we can't fly y'all here, just not going to happen. So how do we, you know, all get remotely on that really important conference call that we were going to have in person type thing? Yeah. You have a no, lot of options at that point. Because uh, there's already, you're seeing the stock market move towards Netflix, for instance, uh, and, and other, you know, home entertainment options as people might have to stay home uh, more often. Like, what would be the hard numbers where you see these video conferencing companies get an uptick in business uh, because people signed up where they didn't have them before because they needed to have more users on board than they were willing to pay for uh, in the past? Uh, it, there's there's a lot of questions here, not a lot of answers, but we will learn something. I think that's the important part. I think Larry's right about that. We are we are being forced into an experiment uh, at this point, and this doesn't even have to do with how serious the outbreak is or not. We're seeing companies pull out of conferences. We're seeing flights reduced because people just don't want to take the risk. And and at that point, uh, that's what makes the experiment happen. It doesn't matter if the virus ends up being as bad as is feared or not. Uh, companies are acting as if it's bad out of an abundance of caution. And therefore, they're trying things that they wouldn't have tried otherwise. Absolutely. And I think, you know, depending on the company, this isn't going to just be like, oh, we've all realized that remote working is the way to go. That doesn't work for every company. There's companies of lots of different sizes that do a lot of different things. But having worked for large companies with certain budgets where it's like you're kind of trying to burn through a bunch of stuff so that it doesn't just go away at the end of the year. I think that there there are people who are going to be rethinking a lot of this. Yeah. Jen, do you, do you, It'll be I mean, interesting you to see. Uh, yeah, like I've been working for home, from home for, oh my gosh, has it been 10 years? Like uh, this, it's not new to me, but a lot of people always ask me about the very common myths. It's like, oh, do you just get to like, you know, browse the internet all day and do 20 minutes of work? No, no, I don't. I wish that was the case. It is still <laughs> a real job, but I also like the peace and quiet. I like being alone and some people are going to have a hard time adjusting to not having that face-to-face -face communication. And that's going to be a real learning curve for people, especially when they're forced to do it, as opposed to getting to do it by choice. No, that's a really good point. Uh, the, you know, working from home, especially for yourself, like we do, uh, is a skill that I have had to learn over the years. And so this may not be a true test in some ways because people haven't got used to the the, the tips and tricks that, that you need to make it work. That's a very, very good point. A Twitter account for Andrew Waltz, Republican candidate for U.S. Congress in Rhode Island, was verified by Twitter earlier this month. Why am I bringing that up? Because the account was not created by anyone named Andrew Waltz. Andrew Waltz does not exist. It was created by a 17-year-old high school student in upstate New York who told CNN he created it over the holiday break because he was bored. And he loves Twitter and wanted to see if he could, you know, trick Twitter into verifying account. So he downloaded a picture from this person does not exist, so it wouldn't match up against someone else and go like, wait a minute, that's just a picture of this other person. Created a fake website for it that looked all all professional. Uh, created a page for the candidate on Ballotpedia. Ballotpedia is a crowdsourced Wikipedia-like thing for looking at candidates and their issues. And Ballotpedia only requires a survey to be filled out for a candidate's information page to be created. That was the weakness in the system. Ballotpedia only requires that because they don't want to inhibit declared candidates. A candidate can declare they're running for an office before they're actually on the ballot. And, and that's good. You want declared candidates to be out there. And the, on the site, they say whether a candidate is officially filed and on the ballot, whether they're a registered write-in candidate or just declaring that they want to run. Uh, where this system failed is that Twitter relies on Ballotpedia for the verification of political candidates in the United States. And somehow the Waltz candidate page from Ballotpedia was submitted to Twitter in a list of candidates to be verified. Ballotpedia says this was their own mistake because they did not distinguish declared candidates from filed candidates in the list and they will make sure to do so in the future because anyone can declare they're a candidate, but that doesn't make them a candidate until they're registered or filed. This story is fascinating. Uh, first of all, uh, you got to be real bored, I guess, over the holiday break. But but it's kind of genius, at, <laughs> right? And it's 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 almost like it's almost like you know hacking into a system and being like, hey, look what I did. I fooled you. And then the company goes, oh yeah, crap. We did so something wrong. Let's fix that. So 
it actually ends up being better. But as you said, Tom, Ballotpedia is at fold here. Twitter's kind of like, I mean, all right. Yeah. You know, we we were trusting you to to send us stuff uh, that should be verifiable. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, for change, I'm not blaming Twitter on this. Like, I'm happy that Ballotpedia turned it around pretty quickly, identified this is the error. We will fix this. It's still kind of bad that it got this public because misinformation is a huge thing and you don't want them to not trust the news that is verified. So what lesson are we teaching? Yeah, no, this is this is good because uh, Ballotpedia takes responsibility for this. Uh, also, the, the high school student uh, didn't go out and promote the account. He's like, I didn't want to fool people. So he only had like 10 or 11 people following him. Uh, he just wanted to see if it worked. And so it was kind of a penetration test, mm -hmm. uh, which means Really, this is a good news story, which is kid found weakness in system before someone else did and caused us some actual damage with it. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight my favorite sentence from this article, though. The student who CNN Business spoke to with the permission of his parents. Oh. So it is the young kids who are on the ball here more than the adults. <laughs> the parents are like, I don't know what he did. It's like, oh, CNN's talk to him. calling. You want to talk to them? <laughs> right. Matty Stone has a post on Mediums 1.0 discussing a new paper about the impact of data centers on power usage and subsequently climate change. The concern has been that data centers use 1% of global electricity, and that could rise significantly in the coming years. A paper published in the journal Science called Recalibrating Global Data Center Energy Use Estimates integrates data that includes energy efficiency trends to come to a more accurate estimate of data center energy use overall. The authors use data on server sales and equipment efficiency rather than IP traffic. The authors also found modest growth is to be expected. However, tech companies aren't fully transparent, leaving room for error. Yeah. So in the past, people have just used IP traffic and say, well, as traffic goes up, energy goes up. Uh, and that looked very scary in its consumption patterns. Uh, what these authors did was say, well, that doesn't account for energy efficiency. Let's try to account for that. We'll look at the servers that are being bought, estimate how much traffic those server, how much power those servers will use in their in their life and how energy efficient they are will then be baked into the calculation. There's still some criticism of this paper uh, because of what you said. You're not knowing all of the usage characteristics because the companies aren't transparent. So there could be things that are missed here, but it does imply that yes, this is a worry, but not as catastrophic a worry as might have been implicated in previous work. Yeah. Like the data centers aren't going away. Bitcoin miners aren't going away until that whole thing crashes and who knows how long or if that will come. I do like partial good news and I do like people taking these studies and sending a critical eye to them, both the ones that are, oh no, everyone's doomed and oh no, everything's going to be kind of okay because we need to find the facts about this and hopefully companies will step forward and learn to be more transparent as people get more climate conscious. Yeah, and, and and you know, Bitcoin was specifically not part of this, so that that could be another way that that you know energy usage does become a problem. But uh, right now, Bitcoin usage has not increased the way people have thought, so that's good news. Uh, the other thing is that as energy efficiency improves, people tend to use it more, uh, and so it's harder to project. Like they're they're trying to project in this paper that energy efficiency will continue to get better, and that'll help. Uh, but if energy efficiency gets a lot better, then we'll just use more more energy uh, and, and use more of these servers. So it's it's not like you say, it's it's partial good news. And and I think it's it's worth paying attention to because of that. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Chinese League of Legends Pro League announced it's resuming its season March 9th. That's good news. It had suspended play over the COVID-19 concerns. Uh, players that want to participate will have to go through a 14-day monitored quarantine period uh, so that they don't infect other players. They'll have to meet all local health requirements, and matches will be shifted to online play only rather than in front of fans. Uh, that way, you know, they're not risking the, uh, the the spread of the virus through the people who attend and watch these. So you're going to have the matches. They're just not going to be in front of anyone. Uh, people will have to watch them online. That apparently is becoming a trend. Uh, Jen, there, there's even more of this going on in Poland and elsewhere. Yeah, it is 
is uh, it is breaking news day on DTNS discussion because there have been a number of announcements. Now, the one thing I want to highlight for the LPL announcement that you just talked about, for the online matches, uh, most of these are going to take place at the specific team houses that the players are from. And we're permitted, they're going to send referees to each team house to make sure that everyone's following the rules. And that's kind of a new thing. And I'm looking forward to that because it makes sense. It's a lot cheaper to also just send out two referees as opposed to send out everybody to one space. To one space, yeah. But yes, so Poland, there is a Counter-Strike uh, major going on right this second. And hours before everybody was ready to go inside the stadium, the local authorities pulled their permit for crowds. Every everyone is hanging out in hotels and working on Reddit and Discord to find where they're going to hang out because everybody already traveled there. So only the players and the broadcasters are in the stadium playing games right now. They've all, ESL has already said everyone's going to get their tickets refunded. Anybody who ordered a goodie bag is going to have it shipped to them for free. They are handling this amazingly for the few hours notice that they had. But there's more. There's more than just uh, than just Counter Strike and League, because Capcom Pro Tour put out an announcement this morning saying that they have been closely monitoring news relating to the coronavirus. We have decided to remove the let's see Brussels Challenge, NorCal Regionals, and April Annihilation from this year's Capcom Pro Tour for Street Fighter V. That means like the events aren't canceled, but there will be no more Pro Tour points available. This is going to reduce participation because if you are living in Japan, do you want to get on a plane and fly to NorCal for no Pro Tour benefit? So that's an interesting then, way of going about this, where they're not canceling the event. They're just making it less desirable so fewer people show up. They don't want to be responsible yeah. is my kind of read from it. But 10 minutes after that Capcom announcement went out, the Brussels Challenge organizers posted a statement saying that with great regret... The entire Brussels challenge has been canceled. So that's anyone kind of who has flight to Belgium might want to, you know, <sighs> relook that. So that, that's kind of a cascading thing where the pro tour said, well, this isn't going to count for pro points. And then the organizers of the challenge go, well, if we're not going to get the people coming here for pro points, is it worth the risk to even put it on at all? And I guess they decided no. Oh, there's more than Street Fighter at these tournaments as well. There are very, there's almost none that are Street Fighter specific. So for people who are in the Tekken World Tour, which I have not seen an announcement yet. If one broke right now, I apologize because I can't look at it. Mm -hmm. um, but for all the anime games and just for the general hangout, because the fighting game community is a very deep community. And this is sometimes their one chance a year to go see all their friends and hang out in the hotels. I don't know what's going to happen. My favorite tournament is coming up later, uh, Combo Breaker, which moved to a new venue, and it's huge. What happens is, will local authorities let these events go on? Uh, will insurance start tanking things? I said that this was going to be a really complicated year for esports. I did not factor in pandemics. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen for the rest of this year, whether every event will have to switch to online, and then you have the risks of online play, like Street Fighter V netcode ain't great. And uh, how that will affect the, uh, what is it, the Intel tournament that's IOC-backed. So it's kind of an Olympic event and will be taking place in Tokyo. Will that get to go on later? Will that happen? What about those qualifiers that happen in advance? There are way more questions than answers right now. Yeah, and a, and a lot of this ties into uh, coverage that is, you know, outside of the purpose of Daily Tech News Show, which, you know, uh, ep epidemiology is not our specialty here. But uh, a lot of this is abundance of caution. Uh, you're seeing these happen in places that don't have a lot of cases. Uh, they're doing it to make sure that they don't put people at risk, but they don't know what the risk is. Uh, and and it's really interesting to watch this happen because we, we have a fairly decent idea of what happened in Hubei province uh, and how the Chinese crackdown there prevented the spread outside of Hubei uh, somewhat. There, it did spread outside of Hubei, but the the death toll and the transmission rate outside of Hubei province is much lower than it was inside because they basically just shut everything down. Uh, and the question is, with a different kind of government, uh, what can you do, what should you do with different kinds of economic considerations? What can you do, what should you do in places like Italy and Korea that are starting to see larger outbreaks to prevent transmission and reduce the time it takes uh, for this to reach its peak and then decline. And 
we see the World Health Organization saying this is going to show up in every country in some way. So every country needs to plan now for that. Uh, and, and that's when you hear those messages, that's why these companies are like, well, wait a minute, it may not be here now, but we don't want to be holding the big event when it does show up and we don't know when it's going to show up. So they're trying to, to make their best guesses about this stuff. Yeah. They're, they're kind of balancing the horrible PR that will happen if people get sick there versus the kind of rough behind the scenes issues of sponsors are going, what are we going to do? teams losing out on all their opportunity to sell merchandise to fans on the floor because that is a pretty solid business and now they're going to have to figure out how to transition to more online and kind of dropping the LAN aspect possibly entirely if they cannot continue to bring just the two teams and broadcasters together because it's not just the businesses that suffer if you cancel this uh, a lot of people make their their money make their salary make their living not only playing esports but providing support uh, contractors that come in and, and put things together don't have don't get paid if they don't have to put things together. Uh, so it, you don't want to cancel this stuff if you if there's no reason to, right? If you don't want to be the company that canceled everything and then it turned out like oh there was there was no cause for concern. Why did you do that? Uh, so it's it's really difficult to judge that line. And it is I think it's good to see these organizations erring on the side of caution. I, I think the Capcom Pro Tour announcement particularly was very interesting, the way they just sort of said, let's reduce the importance of the event, not cancel it outright. That, and they've only mentioned those events specifically. They have said that the rest of the events right. at this moment will proceed as scheduled. Hey, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, submit stories, and vote on other stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Also join the conversation in our Discord right now or later, whenever you want. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Got a voice mailbag. Always love those. This one came from Anthony, and it was a follow-up on the question that Tom asked yesterday, why Northrop Grumman's MV1 is providing five years of service to the Intelsat 901 satellite. Hello, DTNS crew. This is Anthony Colangelo from MainEngineCutoff.com. Yesterday, you were wondering why Northrop Grumman decided to go with a five-year term for those mission extension vehicle services with Intelsat 901. Well, there's no technical reason. It's really a business decision. Each mission extension vehicle has a 15-year lifespan on orbit, so they decided to go with a five-year term for Intelsat 901. That leaves them 10 years beyond that, where they could detach and attach to another satellite to provide services there, or Intelsat could extend it if they still have viable business with Intelsat 901. Another thing you're going to hear about in the future from Northrop Grumman is mission extension pods, which instead of attaching an entire second satellite to the, the target satellite, these would be tiny pods that would take over uh, propulsion services for the satellite itself. So that's something they're working on in the future that would be a little bit more flexible than a single dedicated satellite for these extension services. Thank you, Anthony. That was great. I love getting that kind of insight uh, from totally. the audience. Appreciate that uh, very much. Also, Marcus from Beginning to Thaw, Minnesota, don't, don't <laughs> jinx it, Marcus, uh, said, regarding the story on the code in the latest iOS beta for internet recovery on the iPhone, that's the one where we said you wouldn't have to plug it in. You could just recover your firmware uh, from the iPhone itself. Marcus says, I think it might connect to that rumor a couple months ago about a port-free iPhone. Makes sense that Apple would want to ensure iOS Internet Restore worked flawlessly before releasing a phone without a port. Super smart, Marcus. Thank you. That's a, that, that makes a lot of sense. If both these rumors are true, they would seem to fit together quite well. Shout out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Rushon Brantley, Adam Carr, and Martin James. Ah, uh, Len Peralta has been busy drawing during the show. Uh, Len, what have you made for us today? Well, you know, I know you said that, you know, uh, uh, dealing with health issues isn't DTNS's uh, forte, uh, but I decided to take today's art uh, because, you know, the coronavirus is on everybody's mind. And really, really simply, am I going to get it? People are thinking, what's going to happen? Uh, the very, very simple thing is just to remember to wash your hands, folks. Yeah. Just remember to wash your hands. Uh, I just retweeted something on my Twitter that says how to wash your hands if you don't know how to do it, <laughs> which is kind of blowing my mind that there are people out there who don't know how to do it. 
But really, the best defense against COVID nineteen and coronavirus is just to wash your hands. Wash your so, hands. Don't touch. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your eyes. Uh, if you have kids, remind them to wash their hands all the time before dinner, going out after the bathroom every time. Uh, so what the uh, the image today is a PSA for that. And you can, uh, if you're a Patreon of mine, and you know, I definitely would love you to have be a Patreon, uh, patreon.com forward slash Len. You can get this right now or at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. Yeah, you don't have to be an epidemiologist to know you should wash your hands. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> right. But there's also a technique involved. Yes. Learn how to do it well. Thanks also to Jen Cutter. I was going to announce your job, but I feel like you should announce your new job. You got a new job. I do. I had been teasing it for a while. It was a long time coming. It was finally made public yesterday. I am the new creative director of racedepartment.com. Thank you. I get to uh, help assist with coverage for all the sim racing titles on PC and console. And we also cover actual motorsports. So F1 season is ramping up and I get to nerd out about that, not just on my Twitter anymore. So for everybody who had been messaging me over the past years saying, when are you going to write and do videos on games again? The answer is next week. You'll start seeing <laughs> stuff from me at racedepartment.com. This Woo! site looks so cool. It's full of race cars. How could you not love this? <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, congratulations, Jen. That's fantastic. So racedepartment.com. Go check it out. Uh, hey, thanks to Aaron Coakley, who wrote to us uh, saying... Happy to double my support starting next month to two whole dollars. Thanks for the great shows. Uh, Thank you, Aaron. Uh, It may not seem like a lot to Aaron, but it means a whole lot to us. So if you want to follow Aaron's example, head on over to patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you have feedback, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. It's going to be 20... Uh, 30 UTC pretty soon. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)